Lord is our creator, big L-O-R-D in the Old Testament. Okay? Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I am the Lord, your Savior. I am the one who had created you. And then it goes on, the one who laid the foundation under the earth, so on and so forth. But in the New Testament, it's the same thing. In his Son, whom he had appointed, heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds. Again, that's that expressed image, who being the effulgence of his glory, the very image of his substance. Again, in verse 10, and you, O Lord, have said, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and in the heavens are the work of your hands, making reference to Jesus Christ. Now, we don't have two creators. It's just identifying him. Okay? And again, when because I want to move fast, I'm halfway done, <laughs> and I want to be able to finish today, and some of these that it's just redundant on what I'm saying, you can read it more later when you have the PowerPoint. Okay? Again, beginning was the Word, the Word was made flesh. This one we had on Monday. These are comments that Jesus said, if you knew me, you would know the Father. When you see me, you see the Father. If you believe on me, you're believing in the Father. If you hate me, you hate my Father. One of the same. He is the expressed image of the invisible God. Where is the Father? I've been with you so long, you still don't know who I am. When you see me, you see the Father. The Father in me is doing the works, the miracles. He is the expressed image of the invisible God. He is the Father manifested in flesh. He is God manifested in flesh. The fullness of deity dwelt in Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. He is the expressed image of the invisible God. No contradiction. They all are saying the same thing. Just read your Bible. Not a catechism. Incarnation of God. <laughs> Firstborn begotten of the Father. Okay. Father and Son are titles depicting relationship, not eternal gods. Now, when the Bible talks about he's the begotten Son, it's, there's two kind of meanings. The first one, he is the begotten son because he caused him to be or brought him into existence. And in Psalms, it's giving you that prophecy. But then in Hebrews, John and Luke, it's validating the begotten son, the firstborn. Okay? Begotten of the father, begotten of the father. Begotten and eternal is not the same. He is not the eternal son. He is the begotten son. You will never find eternal son in the Bible. So he's the first begotten of the Father. But also, he's the, res the first one resurrected from the grave. I will de declare, he has said to you, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And then the verses are making reference to this about the resurrection. The first one also to raise from the dead to live forevermore. So he is begotten from the dead. He is begotten to be brought into existence after the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the begotten, the firstborn, resurrected from the grave. Every knee will bow to Jesus, right? But in the Old Testament, Yehoha, the big L-O-R-D, the Tetragrammaton says, every knee will bow to him. Wasn't I... I Made it bigger there. The Lord, big L-O-R-D, there is no other God, Elohim, except me. There is no other righteous God and Savior besides me. Turn to me and be saved. I am God, there is no other. Every knee will bow down to me. But in the New Testament, in Philippians, at the name of Jesus, every will, everyone will bow. And everyone will confess. It's one of the same. Every knee shall bow to Jesus, honoring him for who he really is. Every tongue shall swear. This expression is taken from a practice of taking an oath, allegiance to a sovereign. And here it means everyone would solemnly acknowledge him to be the true God and submit themselves to him, to his government and will. Okay? When we are honoring him and we bow down to him, we are giving glory to the Father, recognizing who he is and worshiping him for who he is. Okay, and that's just kind of what this is going on to say. John 
5.23, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. No other name given whereby we can be saved. The Son of God came, but we under, because he's an expressed image of the invisible God that we cannot see, we can know the true God who is eternal life. And it's talking about Jesus being that true God. This we made reference to as well. Okay, and this is why baptism is easier to understand that in the Bible it's done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because there is no other name, there is no other God. That is the redemptive name of our God. Many people who are really stuck on believing three, not everybody does. I know a lot of Trinitarians who also baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's very clear in the Bible. But some who really do believe there is three, they would be more apt to have a problem with baptism in Jesus' name because they still kind of have the mentality there's really three different deities, there's three different persons, and you're only having the Son. What about the Father? What about the Holy Spirit? Okay, but there isn't three. Again, that first baptismal change we talked about yesterday. God in three different roles. The role is the creator, the son, and his spirit in our heart. We talked about this. I'm in the father. The father's in me. The cup is in the water. The water's in the cup. If I break that cup, the water just will all blend all together. If you take away the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, you just have that omnipresent spirit because there is only one deity. When did God come our savior? Again, in prophecy. He will be our ruler. It talks about the child to be born. But again, it calls him the mighty God and everlasting Father, not the eternal Son. God with his people. We talked about this one on Monday as well. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus, meaning he saves. Yeshua will save. He will save his people from their sins. Another prophecy, Isaiah 43, 10, 11. Jehovah is speaking here, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, okay? And then it's talking about, um, and my servant whom I have elected that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God formed. Uh, I am Jehovah, there is no Savior beside me. The Savior is born, who is? Christ the Lord, fulfilling what he said, okay? The living God, who is the Savior of all? Titus. We're looking forward to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean our great God and Savior, Jesus, next to him, is coming back. Again, that's the word and, it's kaya, and it can be translated also, also, even, indeed, likewise, yea, even. Our great God, even our Savior, Jesus Christ, or indeed our Savior, Jesus Christ, or also our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's both. Titus the same. Our God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We don't have two saviors and we don't have two gods. It's just locating them. Okay? God was in Christ. These are all saying the same thing. The Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Jesus said no one takes his life. He lays it down of his own and he could take it up of his own. He made reference to his body destroyed this temple in three days, I will bring it up again. We didn't kill God. The Lamb of God died. The sacrifice. Okay, the scapegoat. Jesus became our sin bearer. He was our scapegoat. In the, if you're familiar with the tabernacle plan, the scapegoat, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, two lambs it took to depict what Jesus will do for us on the cross. One had to die, and one had to run away with the sins. If they only had in type and shadow and prophecy one died, all we understand is something's dying. But one died, and because one died, our sins can be removed. Jesus is that scapegoat. The Lord laid our sins upon him. He died, but by dying, he is taking away our sins, providing where our sins could be remitted 
in his name and in his blood. This is